Hello, and welcome to the North American Fruit Explorers 2021 virtual conference, Fruit Forward, Growing for Tomorrow. My name is Taylor Malone, and I'm a volunteer board member of NAFEX, and will be serving as the facilitator for this session, Agroforestry and Alternative Agriculture. Before I introduce today's panel, I'd like to share a few housekeeping items and a little about NAFEX as we allow a few more people to join. First, this is a webinar, so unlike in Zoom meetings, participants' audio and video features are automatically disabled. Second, we encourage you to ask questions. Please use the Q&A tab in Zoom to ask topical questions or technical support questions for our co-hosts. Uh, third, if you are newer to Zoom, you can adjust your screen view and some Zoom settings on your device. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available to members and conference participants at nafex.org. Just a few words about NAFEX. Founded in 1967, the North American Fruit Explorers is a network of individuals throughout the United States and Canada devoted to the discovery, cultivation, and appreciation of superior varieties of fruits and nuts. Although the ranks of our membership include professional pomologists, nursery owners and commercial orchardists, NAFEX members are all amateurs in the truest sense of the word, and they're motivated by their love of fine fruit. NAFEX members share ideas, information, experiences, and fruit propagating material via our website, social media channels, fruit specific interest group meetings, and annual conferences like this one, whether in person or online or both. As a paid NAFEX member, you get four editions of the P Pomona Journal each year, as well as the ability to search 50 years of Pomona's in our digital library, which contains a wealth of fruit growing information. This organization exists because of fruit growing members like you, and we encourage you to continue your membership and become actively involved as an interest group member, committee member, or board member. Please visit our website to learn more at nafex.org. So first off for today, we're gonna to have NAFEX board member, Chris Homanix, uh, come on and share a quick introduction to the concept of agroforestry. Uh, see if we can get Chris up on here. Hello, Chris. Thanks, Taylor. Mm -hmm. Hey, Taylor. Uh, well, well, welcome, everybody. Um, I think some of you are probably aware of what agroforestry is, but I suspect not everyone is. And what is agroforestry? Well, it's a combination of two words, uh, agronomy and forestry. It's really something that we have been doing as human beings since before written time all over the world. Um, not every culture, of course, is integrated with the forest, but most cultures of the world have been or are integrated with trees in some way. Um, I want to give some quotes and some kind of philosophical background, too. And so, quote. What we are doing to the forest of the world is but a mere reflection of what we are doing to ourselves and to one another, Chris Mazur. And uh, as you all know, we live in a time of broadening chaos and disorder. It's frank and, you know, just prevalent and noticeable and in our face. And uh, trees and forests, by their very nature, offer a balance and normalcy. Um, they offer us solace and uh, peace, a place to contemplate reality, life, our relationships, where we are, what we're doing, where we're going. Um, they help normalize the climate. Th they develop soils uh, that are rich um, and diverse. They uh, store nutrients and water in the landscape. They offer many rich niches for species to live. Um, they also can meet many of our supply line needs locally of foods, medicines, and materials. Um, forest ecosystems can last for a very long time. And um, the nutritional density of tree products uh, also tends to be higher over annuals. Um, quote, a society that grows great when old men plant trees who say they will never know um, that whose shade they know they shall never sit in, a Greek proverb. Um, they remind us that there are many generations that came before us of humans, um, of, of what came before us, um, that, that there is 
a, we, we sit in a long time frame on this planet. We sit in a cosmological framework as well. And they remind us that if we take care of things that there are many generations to come. Um, trees are, are a metaphor in that way for us to understand deep time. Um, and in that way, uh, they also provide uh, gr good yields over time as opposed to annual agriculture. Um, I like my carrots and corn, but uh, chestnuts and apples and persimmons and more are more enduring, more viable over time. Um, a seed in the heart of an apple is an orchard invisible, a Welsh proverb. They remind us to take care of our relatives, human and otherwise. Um, I, I suggest that we, we think of becoming, uh, again, tree-based culture, and I, I don't have a word for this, I've written about this a lot, but I call it arbora culture because I, I don't have, you have a word, maybe you do, but I think we ought to find a word, a meme that we can share that uh, encourages us to uh, think of forest-based agriculture, agroforestry. And uh, I'll leave you with a couple other, uh, couple other things. Uh, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is now. And trees are poems that the earth writes upon the sky, Khalil Gibran, the mystic. And to be without trees would, in the most literal way, to be without our roots. So I, I hope you listen deeply to the following speakers. Uh, they offer a lot of different perspectives of what agroforestry is, from orchards to uh, more of a horticultural scent, sense of tending the forest. So thank you. Taylor? Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, all right. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our panel members. Tonight, we're joined by Zach Elfers of the Nomad Seed Project. Max Pascal of Shelterwood Forest Farm, and Eric Hagen of the Savannah Institute. So without further ado, let's get started. It's my pleasure to introduce Zach. Zach runs a small nursery, Future Forest Plants, which specializes in native tree crops like hickories, persimmons, walnuts, hazelnuts, chestnuts, plums, pawpaws, and more. He also grows a variety of native plants and edibles, medicinals in particular. Zach's ecological understanding is informed by years of study and travel, supplemented by research, reading, and writing, some of which is shared at the Nomad Seed Project blog. His main interest is cultural landscapes and the ways in which indigenous humans and bioregional ecologies may partner together in mutually supportive symbioses. Within the context of agroforestry, he comes to understand swiddening systems through experiment. In addition to growing plants and trees, he practices fire management and general landscape level tending of ecosystems. He lives on a 10 acre homestead in south, uh, southern Pennsylvania along the Susquehanna River, the ancestral mixing pot land of, and forgive me if I do not pronounce some of these correctly, Susquehannock, Shawnee, Lenape, Conestoga, Haudenosaunee, and other peoples like the Tutelo and Saponi, and please correct me, Zach, when you get on here, um, but you can follow Zach at nomadseed.com and on Instagram as Woodland Rambler. So with all of that, Zach, if you would like to take it away, and we'll figure out how to get you up on here. Hey, everybody. Thanks, Taylor. Uh, it's exciting to be here with all of you. Um, I have a slideshow I've presented here, so let me hit the button for sharing the screen. Okay, hopefully you all can see this. Anyway, as Taylor mentioned, I live in um, in Pennsylvania, along the lower Susquehanna River. I'm about a stone's throw away from the Maryland border. Where I am is kind of a centrally located area in the mid-Atlantic. So it's it's been a very uh, culturally diverse area for a long time. Uh, ancestrally, this is the lands of the Susquehannock, 
as well as the, Sho the Haudenosaunee, the Six Nations, um, the Lenape were over on the eastern bank. And then down to the south, you had all the, the groups of the Chesapeake, like the Powhatan Confederacy and whatnot. The Tuscarora passed through this area and you had the Shawnee. There's a Shawnee town near me. And um, you also had Siouan speaking groups like the Tutelo and the Saponi. Um, unfortunately, I don't know what they called themselves. But anyway, let me get into it here. So as Chris was introducing this concept of agroforestry, it's, it's pretty simple in one sense. You know, it's just agriculture with trees. You know, if you live in an area where there's trees, I live in the Eastern Temperate Forests bioregion, which is huge. You know, it stretches from Canada all the way down to Mexico and Mesoamerica, and it goes out into the Midwest. Um, so I'm going to be focusing on, on this area because that's really where my expertise is, but I will briefly hit on other areas within the North American continent that um, have trees. And that means that agroforestry is a relevant practice. Now, what I'm going to try to do here is more of like a, almost like a people's history of agroforestry when it comes to indigenous lifeways and the way that Native Americans practiced uh, subsistence methods on this continent. It often wasn't it wasn't as uh, discreet as it is in our uh, modern agronomy. It was, it was more of a total package kind of thing. But at, at the heart of all of this was the slash and burn method. This was the, the initiatory step. You'll also see it called swiggening, referred to as swiggening elsewhere. And the idea is pretty simple. You go into woodland. Hey, Zach, I think we're, we're losing your voice. Chris, can you hear him? Uh, I cannot. Zach, are you still there? I see, Zach. It kind of just faded out. I've, I've lost uh, Zach's picture as well. Okay, I can still see Zach. Can you hear me at all? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, perfect. Apologize for that. Speak into the camera. No worries. Oh, actually, it went away again. Oh, no. <laughs> now it's back. Now it's back. All right. So Stop. the slash point method is pretty straightforward. Oh, I've lost you again. So it's slash, cutting it, and then letting it dry for a season to burn. Am I still fading in and out? Right now, it's good. OK. I'm going to move quickly through all of this. So hopefully, the little bit of text that I include with these images will compensate if I fade out at any moment. Um, but really, the, the slash and burn method is really just the tip of the iceberg. It's the very first step. There's, a, there's so many more things that happen down the line in the, in the wake of making such a clearing. Now, one of the interesting things about doing agriculture this way is that it's, it makes really good soil over time. You get a combination of the charcoal and the ash, uh, which has a moderating effect on the pH. And then you also have manure and... Um, organic wastes like crop residues. You got pottery shards and everything that you would find in a kitchen maybe. It all gets mixed mixed up in this and it can make this rich terra preta soil that is uh, fertile for a thousand years. They call it Amazonian dark earths. And people have noticed that where indigenous people have settled, there tend to be these really amazingly rich soils. You can see on the left, What's more typical of Amazonian forests, you know, highly oxidized, uh, leached, um, basically nutrient poor soil, because most of the biomass is, is up in the up above above ground. It's in the bio, it's in the biomass, it's not in the soil. Um, 
but we had the same thing in the eastern United States and the eastern eastern North America at the time of early settlement. A lot of the old time accounts talked about deep and dark valley soils that were 40 inches deep. All been plowed and farmed and settled. So the milpa, this is the classic example. So it's still traditionally practiced by the Lacandon and Yucatec Maya in parts of Mexico, Belize, and Guatemala. Um, it's hard to translate exactly. I, I, it's often just stated as cultivated field, but when I look into it, it, it seems like it has a little more depth there, something like the inheritance upon which we all stand, um, which we all depend. And the, the milpa is the, is the slash and burn plot that's then transitioned into a garden. So this is a shifting form of agriculture. That's important to point out because you can see on the bottom, the Eurocentric farming practices have these fixed fields. They have these rigidly defined property boundaries and they tend to not change year after year, season after season. So you end up doing the same thing over and over again in a plot. Whereas with the Swiddening method, because it's mobile, um, it's, it, it moves through the landscape and you end up with this shifting mosaic, this patchwork landscape that you see above. And this is what sustained the Mayan civilization and many others. So the milpa is a cycle. This is important to point out that's cyclical nature. And it begins with the slash and burn process. And then the milpa workers, when they sow the fields, they can sow up to 80 to 120 distinct species. But what grows first? The annual plants, of course. And the centerpiece is the corn, beans, and squash, the three sisters, which we know has been exported and through trade and good relations all through North America. But there's all kinds of other annual plants like chilies and amaranth and shinapods and sunflowers and tobacco and all those stuff would be in the, in the first phase of growth. But then after a season or two, you uh, more perennials start to come online. And uh, then the plot grows into a forest garden. This might be year three, four, or five. It depends on your region, it depends on the methods practiced. And then that forest garden will transition back into woodland. And finally, and finally high forest again something resembling old growth. And at this point, it could be slashed and burned and the cycle initiated again. So why, why is this important? You know, we're, we're not, I'm not, I don't wanna just talk about Mayan practices. They're really important. Um, they, they shine a really important light on Swiddening and America as a whole. But like I said, the Three Sisters is the centerpiece of a lot of Native American subsistence all over this continent. And when these, three vegetables were traded throughout the continent, they didn't, they didn't arrive just as corn, just as squash, just as beans. They arrived as a package, a cultural package. And with that came storytelling, with that came mythology, with that came a way of life, um, a way of outlook on reality, uh, even a spirituality. So we can trace some of these stories. This is the classic story of Sky Woman. It's an important creation story of the Haudenosaunee as well as the Anishinaabe and other people. Now, a good story shouldn't suffer the disrespect of being told too quickly. So I'm, I'm not really gonna tell this story because that's not really what this talk is about, but I just want to point out that there are elements of the Swiddening cycle that are in this story. Uh, you could see it as the, the great tree that gets felled, which sets off an ecological imbalance, which sends Sky Woman through the sky to be caught by the, the geese and land on the back of the turtle. And then the, the whole cycle continues. And then, you know, eventually she gives birth to twins, um, good mind and bad mind. And then the, uh, the, the one twin, Bad Mind, who's also named as Flint in some stories, he, whereas his, his brother, Good Mind, 
is is born normally and has good relations with the plants and the animals. Um, Flint is impatient. And so basically he cuts his mother open and he births himself on his own time. He wants to get out of there. And uh, this is talking, this is kind of hinting at, at this process of the, uh, of the slash and burn method. Here's another example to kind of highlight this nuance that I'm trying to hit on in these stories. You got the green corn mother story. Uh, this is lots of people's tell the story, but this one comes from Penobscot in Maine. And the first mother is talking about how at high noon she'll be killed by her sons and they'll drag her over the empty patch of earth until the, her flesh is rent all over the field. And then they'll come back seven months later and everything will be grown up and they'll have all the food that they could need. This is a really visceral depiction of the slash and burn process. We also get the story in the, uh, the Cherokee, Selu, and Kanadi. Um, but I'm going to move on here. So the, the big picture is that to separate indigenous agroforestry from the rest of land and animal care is pretty much impossible. There's a, this deep understanding that everything is all wrapped together in this total package. And what we, what we see is you know, a little bit of culture, a little bit of life way, a little bit of spiritual belief, a little bit of science. Uh, it's, all, it's all wrapped together. And so I, I, I call what, what remains today. So when we go to old native settlements, and current native settlements, we can look around at the flora that exists and we, we can see uh, inklings of, of the, the life ways that gave birth to the reality that we see. And this is what I call cultural landscape. And it's a, it's a legacy that's been um, bestowed. So where I live, there's a Shawnee town and there's a creek called the Pequay Creek. And then this is named for the, the Pequay branch of of the Shawnee, and this word apparently means he is arising from the ashes. So that's a reference to Swidney. And if you go to the these old Shawnee settlement sites, what do you find? You find shagbark hickory, pawpaw, mulberry, persimmon, honey locust, black walnut, bur oak, shellbark hickory. The Shawnee also were in Kentucky, and if you go to the parklands at Floyd's Fork, um, you can see all this and more. And I have a YouTube video there, which. I don't have time to share, but you can click on that on your own time. And these are some of those, some of those trees. We've got shellbar kickery in the upper left. We've got bur oak in the top middle. We've got persimmon on the right, honey locust on the bottom. You can see lots of these examples all over the East Coast, all over the Eastern Temperate Forests region. At the bottom of Lake Owasco, there's a lot of shell bark hickories, shag bark hickories, bicolor oaks, American groundnut in the understory. And this very place is uh, archaeologically significant. It's, it's considered the first place where the Three Sisters agriculture was practiced in the state of New York, presumably by the, uh, the ancestors of the Haudenosaunee peoples. And Historically, if you look through what used to grow and still grows in that area, you find pawpaw, honey locust, Kentucky coffee tree, bur oak, camas, hazelnut, all present in this small area. And it's no accident that, the, that these trees are here and the people are here. And we have the method. We know how they did it through the slash and burn method. We got about five minutes, Zach. All right. This is another example of a place down in Nantuck, uh, Nanticoke, sorry. Anyway, we've got the word Alabama, which is the same as Altamaha, uh, which is famous for you know, John Bartram finding the Franklinia along the banks of the Altamaha. But according to a Choctaw scholar, it, the Alabama means clear of thickets to gather up Russian vegetation. And we've got Manhattan, which is the same name is reflected in other words like the Manitani Creek in Berks County, Pennsylvania. So Manhattan Island was 
post of a legendary grove of shellbark hickories on the shelf south end of the island that all the groups of the lower Hudson Valley region knew about and they came and they would trade. So this linguist Ives Goddard has put together a really compelling case about the true meaning of the word Manhattan. He basically says it means where we gather um, hickory wood for boats. So, you know, this is providing some uh, glimpse on what management may have looked like, you know, with the coppicing and felling of smaller trees for bows, whereas the larger trees and the, the ones more desirable for nuts would have been let go for food. And if you go along the Manitani Creek in Berks County, Pennsylvania, what do you find? Shellbark, hickory, shagbark, black walnut, pawpaw, hazelnut, persimmon, burr, oak, and chicken oak. In the Pacific Northwest, you've got Kitsum Column, um, Robin Town. So this is in British Columbia. It was a, it's a forest garden uh, composed of like apples and hazelnuts and things like that. Um, and this is an example of some of the species that are in the Eastern temperate forest regions that would be part of anthropogenic um, indigenous cyber forestry. Stone fruits like plums, we've got hickory. Collins type of hickory. So you get it from the Algonquin like Bagan or persimmon, pawpaw, Kentucky coffee tree, and honey locust, two trees in the bean family. Burr oak, bicolor oak. Black walnut, butternut, hazelnut, mulberry, chestnut. Now, elsewhere in the West, you've got a whole bunch of different bioregions. You've got like the Great Basin, which might have things like pinion pine and mesquite, juniper, manzanita. Um, you've got the Pacific Northwest, which may have oak savannas with camas in the understory and all, all kinds of other things. A lot of uh, geophytic root foods. You'll find plums and cherries and other stone fruits, you know, buffalo berries, salal, um, golden chinkapin, California hazelnut. Um, you know, here's some examples. Table rocks outside of the Oregon, Marconized Park, Washington. Around the world, slash and burn agriculture is found everywhere that trees are found. The Bantu peoples practice it, Japanese practice it. Southeast Asians practice it. Scandinavians practice it. Uh, it was all through Europe. And here's some book recommendations. So that's about it for me. It's a, it's a lot. It's a lot to cover in a short period of time. So I hope you enjoyed it. Took something away. Thank you so much, Zach. Yeah, that was a whirlwind for sure. <laughs> I can imagine you can go on for quite some more time and I would like to hear that. Um, we're gonna hold questions and answers until the end of the webinar. So I am gonna go ahead and transition to our next speaker, Max Pascal of Shelterwood Forest Farm. Uh, Max is an urban forester and fourth generation horticulturalist from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. In 2016, he started Shelterwood Forest Farm an experimental land stewardship project focused on climate adaptation, agroforestry, and horticultural research. All right, Max, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Max Pascal. I'm uh, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and um, to the towns around it. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here and uh, speak with you all about a very special place that uh, Zach and I and, and a number of other folks um, have been exploring and uh, advocating for and researching uh, for the past, I think, about five years now. Um, you know, when we think about agroforestry and, and where it's at, it's, you know, in, in this country, you know, it's all the projects seem to be very young you know at most we'll have a couple that are a few decades old but there's uh, many more that are starting up all the time but there's there's very few examples of for sure as Zach was talking about the um, uh, the indigenous um, manifestations of and, and expressions of 
uh, forest culture and, ag and agroforestry. Um, and, you know, for, uh, I guess, agroforestry systems that, that can work uh, on, like, on the basis of private property in the, in the same manner that a lot of people are starting them up these days, you know, there's, there's very, very little to actually look at to see, like, what does this look like at maturity? And so uh, that what we're going to look at is actually very exciting because it's uh, a place that anybody can go. It's in the Northeast, just right outside Philadelphia. And it has trees that are up to 100 years old um, and a number of the species that Zach was talking about. So let's get started. So in a sleepy town uh, just outside Philadelphia, a mature agroforestry system has been growing and evolving for the past 100 years. It was started by a man named John Hershey in 1921. And these historic plantings consist of hundreds of mature trees that were suddenly left without a caretaker when Hershey died 60 years ago. This unique collection was subsequently carved apart by developments and left in a state of near complete neglect. During these intervening years, uh, these trees faced a wide range of climatic ex excesses from droughts and deadly heat waves to polar vortexes and hurricanes. And yet, in spite of everything that's been thrown at them, these rare fruit and nut trees still thrive and show what is possible for growing food in this challenging climate. From their origin in 8,000 year in indigenous forest gardening traditions, to boosting biodiversity and increasing climate resiliency. The trees at the Hershey Nursery in Downingtown, Pennsylvania offer a lot more than just fruit. They are a unique and truly remarkable treasure and a living testament to the power and importance of this work. So how did this begin? Uh, in 1921, a man named John Hershey started a small nut tree nursery on eight acres east of Downingtown, Pennsylvania, a town about an hour west of Philadelphia. He worked the nursery during the summer and moonlit as an arborist in the winters to make ends meet. Initially, he sourced a lot of his early tree material from other nut growers and breeders in the region, um, who were, uh, I think, at that time, were at least later on part of uh, the Northern Nut Growers Association. Um, and, uh, but it wasn't until the 1930s that he obtained most of the remarkable trees that subsequently became the backbone of his agroforestry farm. So during the Great Depression, the government initiated the TVA, uh, or Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, as part of the New Deal to bring publicly owned utilities and modernization to the Tennessee Valley, which is an area that experienced high levels of poverty, uh, like 30% of the people had malaria, um, the, the soil was absolutely ravaged by bad farming, um, it was just the, the area was, the entire region was, was in a dire situation, the TVA was created to help solve some of those problems. Uh, and as part of that, they opened up a uh, tree crops department. And uh, J. Russell Smith, who wrote the book, uh, Tree Crops, A Permanent Agriculture, who, uh, that many of you might know. Uh, if you don't, it's an amazing, it's an amazing book. Um, he knew John Hershey, who was a young man at the time, and recommended him. And John Hershey became the, the head of the uh, tree crops department for the TVA. So uh, at the TVA, uh, Hershey initiated a number of projects that quickly bore fruit, um, and uh, one of them was, you know, in order to source the best genetics and germplasm possible of different tree crops, uh, he would put out ads and contests in local newspapers across the rural south and say, if you have honey locusts with really great pods that are very sweet, send them in. If you win, we'll give you 50 bucks. You know, if you have amazing persimmons, send them in, we'll give you 50 bucks if it's the winner, you know hickories, plums, like you name it. And this is the same strategy that Elizabeth White used in Southern New Jersey about 30 years earlier uh, when she was uh, creating the uh, blueberry industry from scratch. Uh, so this is a way to essentially crowdsource like the best genetics possible in a, you know, a pre-digital world. And it was fantastic. You know, a lot of the, the cultivars that are still you know, well-known and, and, and beloved in, in nut growing circles today, like Granger, uh, Hick Hickory, they were finds by John Hershey, who, you know, had some farmer in Tennessee send him like the Granger nut. And he said, this is great. He went uh, and, and he started propagating it. And same thing with uh, two cultivars of uh, honey locust Millwood and Calhoun that have uh, up to something like 40% sugar in the pods, like something like outrageously high uh, levels of sugar from a native tree. Uh, and he utilized those extensively uh, for cattle feed. Um, 
So this is a very elegant method for uh, you know achieving results pretty quickly. And it was those same varieties that he was, you know, crowdsourcing from small farms across the South that he later brought back to Downingtown. And what's really important to note here is that this was, you know, we're talking about like a pre-industrial South, like a, uh, you know, an area that has changed a lot in the past hundred years. So there were still trees in the landscape back then that, you know, if, if they're a hundred years old, then, then they would have been there at the time of, you know, before Europeans in many cases. And so what you have is this crucial period in time, this crucial link between the indigenous land management systems that uh, Zach was talking about and um, the kinds of agroforestry that, that we're planting today. And um, yeah, cause like no, very few of those trees are still in the landscape now, you know, that they've all been developed. Uh, so he got in there right at the, at the last moment. Uh, but so he, he left the TVA, comes back to Downingtown, and for the next 30 years, he developed his tree crop farm and sold grafted and seedling trees of his best uh, stock to farmers across the country. Um, J. Russell Smith writes extensively about Hershey in his book, Tree Crops, and even has a detailed map um, that shows uh, Hershey's farm. You know, this is um, uh, the map that we use when exploring it, and, you know, there's a lot of areas that still match up. And so... You know, when, when we're talking about, okay, like what was Hershey's farm? You know, he had incredible diversity of everything you can imagine. Uh, filberts, blueberries, English and black walnuts, chestnuts, peaches, cherries, pears, jujubes, sugar maples, chinkapin, burr oak, uh, mulberries, wild plums, persimmons, honey locust, more oaks, uh, pecans, hecans, hickories, and, and, and even more. Uh, so this was a place where he was really just... Um, uh, just going hog wild with uh, with tree crops and seeing what was possible in in the southeastern Pennsylvania climate. So, this year, uh, twenty twenty one, excuse me, uh, marks the hundredth anniversary of the Hershey Nursery, uh, and the oldest trees on the site are likely close to that age. You know, there's still like a couple of hecan trees that are just unbelievably huge that, like, right on the street. You know that that could easily be some of the largest and oldest in the world. Um, so this is one of the only places where you can actually see mature pecans, persimmons, honey locusts, hickories, and more that are close to a century old growing together in a cohesive way. Um, so for people thinking about agroforestry, this, this site is absolutely like essential. You know, you, you cannot go wrong go, going there. Uh, and more impressively, many of these trees are accessible to the public. You know, after the farm was sold off, uh, it's parceled out and developed. So now, you know, there's a strip mall and a preschool and, you know, housing development and a church. And uh, it's still developing. You know, we've lost a number of, like, amazing trees in the past two years, uh, which is a real tragedy. Uh, but there's still many that exist. And they were just left in, like, the grassy medians, you know, like, you're, you're parking in a parking lot and there's, uh, you know, persimmons dropping next to your car, you know, there's black walnuts dropping on the cars and driving down the highway right next door. Um, there's a giant hecan tree just looming over the street. You know, this is all just in public rights away. Um, and so you can literally just drive up to the quick to the Quaker meeting house in Downingtown, look across the street and you see this and it's absolutely breathtaking. So, you know, while, um, while American agriculture has largely been based around European crops, what John Hershey, J. Russell Smith, and their colleagues were finding um, was that native nut and fruit trees offered unbelievable potential for improvement and integration into farming systems. Uh, Hershey sourced superior genetic material throughout the East Coast, but he had the most success in the Southeast, particularly in uh, Tennessee, the Carolinas, and Georgia. Which is, um, pretty, uh, And so what he had an inkling of, and perhaps didn't know the, understand the full extent, was how much these incredible tree crop finds of superior hickories and honey locusts and others were the remnants of thousands of years of indigenous land stewardship and crop improvement. The fact that the best honey locusts were discovered in traditional Cherokee territory, a culture that has extensively used this tree, is no coincidence. Uh, even the most basic look at southeastern native land management in the early colonial period, or you know, uh, what, even what Zach was talking about just now, there's a great introduction to this. Um, demonstrates that 
almost all of the trees that Hershey and other agronomists were finding and working with were the very keystone species of indigenous forest gardens that were tended across half, this half of the continent. So the fact that Hershey had so much, so much success uh, achieving high yields and good flavor and robust growth habits with these trees was because the genetic material that they were breeding with had already undergone 8,000 years 8,000 years of or more of selection and improvement by native farmers in North America. John Hershey was sourcing his plant material from a landscape whose indigenous stewards had been, with rare exceptions, uh, forcibly removed a century or two prior. The entirety of his success was founded on this fact. Uh, the plants that he was using were important remnants of the rich and diverse native landscapes that made this continent a paradise. Um, but even with the wonder and power and importance of Hershey's work with agroforestry, at best, he was working with the mere shadow of the forest gardens and managed landscapes that had been here before. His combinations of nut and fruit trees were a drastic improvement over the extractive farming practices of his neighbors, but it existed completely devoid of the cohesive cultural and spiritual context in which the trees had been managed for millennia. And here we touch again on um, what Zach was talking about with a lot of those foundational stories um, and, and how you know, it, it, you can't just separate out like this is a farm, this is an agroforestry farm, this is, you know, like it, everything was part of a co cohesive whole. Um, and so, you know, these plantings lack that, you know, there isn't any cultural context in, in our society for, uh, for this. Um, and so for those of us dreaming of a future in which agroforestry plays a greater role, this history shows us that taking cues and direction from indigenous groups about how to move forward is one of the best strategies we can employ. So to put it simply, uh, there is no substitute for thousands of years of a direct experience with this landscape. That type of experience is not something we can study or innovate, innovate our way into. So instead of trying to reinvent the wheel, um, supporting indigenous land-based initiatives around you uh, could be an effective way to ensure a livable and biodiverse future. And the kinds of partnerships that can come out of this ethic are really inspiring. And uh, I hope we get to hear about one of them from Eric in the, in the next panel session. The second valuable insight uh, from the Hershey nursery revolves around the other kinds of life it supports. In agroforestry circles, we talk a lot about yield or disease resistant uh, use to maturity or other agronomic qualities. Uh, we don't hear a lot though about how much biodiversity in agrosystem forest uh, that's an agroforestry system can host. There simply isn't research into it in this country that I know of. Uh, and one of the most interesting aspects of the Hershey nurseries is the fact that he utilized um, in the vast majority of his trees are native to the East Coast. So, you know, in spite of controversies in our field around terms like native, non-native and invasive, uh, the current science overwhelmingly demonstrates that native plants often, and not, not always, but often, uh, support more biodiversity in more ways than non-native species. And having co-evolved in partnership with native fauna for millions of years, like this, this shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. Um, and one of the many, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can measure this, but one of like the simplest ways is to look at the diversity of Lepidoptera, which are moths and butterflies and, you know, in the form of caterpillars, you know, what every tree uh, hosts, you know, different species of caterpillars. Caterpillars are a crucial source of protein for, uh, songbirds feeding their fledglings in the spring. So if you have a tree, as you see, like, like oak, um, that supports a huge number of species of caterpillars, then you have a much greater chance of attracting songbirds. And so you have this terrific cascade throughout your, your ecosystem. And, you know, this is by no means the only way of measuring the capacity of a system to support biodiversity, but it is a very helpful one. Um, so for instance, uh, like we just mentioned, uh, native oak trees grown by Hershey can support up to 534 species of caterpillars. Um, but it can go the other way too. You know, there's autumn olive, which is a very popular non-native, aggressive, some would say invasive plant that is favored by permaculture circles right now. Um, and that species supports somewhere between zero and three species of Lepidoptera. Uh, native hickories support 235 caterpillar species, black walnut 130 species, American persimmon is a bit lower in this metric, it only supports uh, 46 species, but as anybody who's seen one knows, it attracts a lot of other animals every time it drops fruit. Um, apples are a notable exception to this rule, 
uh, for some reason, the plasticity of the genetics in uh, the genus Malus or apples is, um, means that non-native apples, just like the regular common apples that you can graft and grow, uh, support the same, host the same number of species, a stunning 308 species of caterpillars as the native crab apples. So, you know, there are exceptions to this. And there's also other situations as well, like with chestnuts, you know, American chestnut hosts at least 127 species of caterpillars. I don't know of any research yet into whether like the Chinese chestnuts that are grown uh, at Hershey's nursery support the same number, less, more. I, it, that's another important question. So when considering what plants to use in agroforestry systems, uh, looking at how much biodiversity each species can host might be the most important factor that never gets considered. This is a very easy thing to do as well. You can find exactly how many species of caterpillars are hosted on any given plant species in your region by going to the website listed, listed on the slide. And finally, uh, not to end on a downer, uh, but the third factor that we're, we'll look at is climate change. Uh, so anyone here who's grown a hickory uh, understands that a tree can take many years to uh, reach maturity and agroforesters and orchardists alike often have to think in decades rather than in months or years. So when it comes to climate change, uh, while we can hope for a best case scenario, uh, it's also necessary for us to be aware of just how drastically local conditions uh, can change within the lifetimes of the trees that we're planting. Say, taking white oak again, uh, a tree that can live up to 600 years and one of Hershey's uh, three favorite trees for agroforestry systems, it often doesn't begin producing acorns until about age 20. And even then the crops are kind of sparse until about age 50. So let's consider this in the context of climate change. Uh, where I am uh, in Philadelphia, uh, with essentially the same climate as Downingtown, uh, we are currently hardiness zone 7B and heat zone 6. Under a high emissions scenario, which is one where you know we don't take any meaningful measures to cut uh, carbon emissions or soak up atmospheric CO2, which is currently what the case is, um, we could jump two hardiness and heat zones within 20 to 50 years. Uh, and that's the same amount of time that a white oak grown from seed today will take to start producing its own seedlings. So a jump of two hardiness and two heat zones in uh, 20 to 50 years uh, brings our climate closer to Jacksonville, Florida and New Orleans. Uh, so, you know, this is very drastic situation. And in this business as usual, yeah, sorry, business as usual scenario, uh, the coolest summers in southeastern Pennsylvania in 30 years could be the same temperature as the hottest summer is currently on record. Meanwhile, the coldest winters in the future could be like the warmest winters ever experienced in the 20th century. Um, under these conditions, Pennsylvania's forests will change drastically and some of our most diverse habitats will likely be lost in favor of a much more southern palette of oak hickory and pine forests. And if you want to learn more about these uh, projections, um, and just make sure I'm not making them up out of whole cloth, uh, you can check out um, the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Sciences, this branch of the Forest Service. They have free uh, seminars and trainings throughout the year, and fantastic resources. So that's NIACS for short. So he didn't know it at the time, uh, but John Hershey was sourcing the majority of his species and germplasm from areas of the Southeast that have similar climates to what we may experience in Pennsylvania in the near future. As a result, the trees at the Hershey nursery, so pecans, which aren't native in Pennsylvania, persimmons, which are rare, hickories, um, and, and others that are very classic of the Southeast, are more likely than uh, the locally native sugar maples and birches in Downingtown to thrive for another 100 years. When, you know, uh, regardless of whatever summer highs or wonky winters or storms might be coming down the pike, these southern trees are already well adapted to the conditions of the future here. And there's, there's a word for this. Uh, you know, ecologists call this assisted migration. Because of human development and deer pressure, most plants are functionally incapable of migrating north quickly enough to keep pace with the rapid changes in climate that are occurring. As a result of all classes of life, trees are the most at risk of facing mass extinctions in the near future, according to the IPCC. But by bringing southern natives to the northeast today, we can help trees and other plants reach areas where they will be able to survive and thrive uh, the coming changes. 
far from a risky endeavor. This, this has been a practice among horticulturists on the East Coast for three centuries. And native peoples have been expanding the ranges of plants like pawpaws, yopan, chickasaw plum, and others for millennia. So the risks associated with assisted migration have been found by researchers to be close to zero. And when I say assisted migration, I'm not saying, you know, bring something from Siberia and plant it in New England. I'm saying, you know, bring something from Pennsylvania and plant it in New England, bring something from the Carolinas, put it in Pennsylvania. So things that are plants that already have um, ecological partners in the same bioregion. Um, yeah, so uh, because at, yeah, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, uh, insects and animals don't really care much about state or county boundaries. And so these Southern native trees will still support most of their faunal biodiversity in Northern states, oftentimes more than non-native tree crops from other continents as we saw earlier. So as agroforesters or fruit growers, uh, it's, this is important for us as well. If we really want to create agricultural systems that thrive, produce food and support biodiversity long into the future, it's crucial that we source tree genetics preferably native to the South, that are capable of handling the changes in climate that will occur in our regions. John Hershey did not know that he was planting a bulwark against climate change when he set down his tree crops, but this collection of plants has already proved its metal by surviving and producing enormous amounts of food every year with almost no management. The same resilience is what we need in all, in all of the agroforestry systems that we're, we are making today. So uh, to summarize, uh, John Hershey's success with tree crops is predicated on more than 8,000 years of indigenous landscape stewardship since the last ice age. Uh, every native tree that he promoted has been a fixture in the managed fruit forests of nations from the Lenape to the Muscogee since long before Europeans arrived. Because he was working with East Coast native trees, this style of agroforestry is capable of supporting a significant level of biodiversity. In fact, that's crucial in this time when we're losing species every year. With this type of planting, our farms and gardens can actually heal a degraded landscape. Finally, due to rapid changes in climate already underway, Hershey's sourcing of material from the deep south meant that the trees in his northern nut tree farm will likely fare better than much of the native forests around Downingtown. What's more, agroforestry farms like this that utilize southern native tree crops can help increase the uh, climate resilience of their local landscape. The Hershey nursery serves as a link between the past and the future. The strength of these systems and what they can teach us about our work is truly inspiring. And I'm not the only one who thinks so either. A number of people have been working on preserving and researching the Hershey legacy far more than I can name here, um, but Zach is one of them. Uh, but their collective work can be found in the, um, at this link that I've, I've listed here. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Max. Uh, I live in Tennessee in the Tennessee Valley and am also have a have a direct connection to the living legacy of Hershey. The TVA sent out millions of seedlings throughout the Tennessee Valley and there's huge chestnut trees and pecan trees in the cities and farms around me and I'm so grateful that I get to forage from those and collect seed and share that seed so thanks for sharing about Hershey. Um, and please uh, Folks, please remember there's a Q&A down there. Please put your questions in there if you have any. Um, and we'll hopefully we can circle back and ask Max some more questions. Um, I would now like to introduce our final speaker for the evening, Eric Hagen of Savannah Institute. Eric recently joined the Savannah Institute as its Wisconsin Farm Director coordinating the planning and implementation of Savannah Institute's agroforestry research, research and demonstration farm campus in Spring Green, Wisconsin. Eric has an extensive background in designing and operating diversified farming operations, researching and educating on agroforestry system applications and working with community partners on enhancing tree and shrub cropping systems across the US. Eric, thanks so much for being here and I'll hand it over to you. Yeah. Um, thanks so much, Taylor. Um, and thanks everyone uh, with the NAFEX community for inviting us all here. This is such an awesome opportunity to engage with all of you. Um, you're all giants that I wish to eventually stand on your shoulders one day. Um, so much to learn and so much respect and regard for all your work. Um, 
and same with uh, with Max and, and Zach um, to follow their presentations this is going to be pretty difficult and I can attest I had uh, the opportunity to visit the Hershey site with both Max and Zach at one point a couple years back and to see their passion and their commitment to preserving that site and and not just that site but the general landscape and the cultural landscape around Pen the Philadelphia Pennsylvania area is incredibly inspiring and has, and has really, really inspired a lot of my work um, all over the, the U.S. But, and most recently here in Wisconsin, um, in the Midwest. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm going to lead to in this conversation. Um, when, when I guess the the organizers were talking about this this panel earlier, they they were thinking about this um, kind of temporal transition through time. <laughs> on uh, where agroforestry is, what is agroforestry and where is it in, in the North American landscape. Um, and so I'm going to focus pretty specifically on what Savannah Institute is doing uh, in, in the Midwest um, and where things are at now and not, and, um, you know, I think Zach and Max gave a great homage to the, to the past and with all due respect and, and honor for that. Um, I'm new to the Midwest, so I, I don't feel like I have the permission from the elders yet to speak on what what this landscape was truly like. As I said, I still have a ton to learn and, and engage with this landscape. So I'll just give a, a run about what Savannah Institute's doing and uh, kind of where we're hoping to move agroforestry in the future. Um, a lot of our work really focuses on um, this main issue of land sparing, it's called, um, where you have a form of agricultural and on one part of the farm, conservation in some certain areas, then nature way over there, and, um, not really sure, you know, this is kind of the status quo um, that we're, we're hoping to kind of uh, capsize, so to speak, by integrating tree cropping systems and in, 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 in within the agronomic system that kind of exists, particularly in the Midwest. But as you all know, this is pretty endemic everywhere in the world at this point with industrial ag. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to go too far into all of that, but that this is kind of the in a sense, this is kind of the, the keystone uh, to go back to PA of where our work is, is really coming from is kind of getting rid of and challenging the status quo and, and reminding and remembering where we came from um, and what's important in life and that it's not just our bottom line and profitability and that sort of thing, but kind of how do we re-envision the landscape and re-envision communities and, and remember and, and um, and honor those of the past. And the way we do this is through agroforestry, the purpose of this, this conversation here. And currently the modern definition of agroforestry kind of sets aside five practices. And I really don't like to do this, um, but I'm kind of last in the temporal time scale. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna hit it. But the, by the USDA definition, and this is accepted globally, there's technically, there's actually technically 146 or something like that practices of agroforestry. But the, the five main ones that we kind of talk about are alley cropping, which is the integration of tree crops with a annual cropping system or a perennial if it's hay or something like that. Uh, so forage or, or grain cropping system, veggies, that sort of thing. Um, there's riparian buffers on the upper right. Um, so this is kind of the edge of field practice to, to and hopefully enhance water quality or restore natural ecosystems along riparian systems. Um, forest farming, which is uh, the production of um, understory medicinals or edibles within a closed canopy system. Uh, windbreaks and hedgerows, also an edge of field practice. Um, and silvopasture, which is integration of livestock within tropping, tro uh, tree cropping systems. And the important thing to remember here is these are just kind of the, the, the polar opposite or the polar extremes, so to speak, the, du the duality, so to speak, of things. Um, but really agroforestry is, as we've heard from the last two speakers, is a pretty massive gradient um, and can look a million ways. And, and we have a lot to innovate and learn and we have a lot to remember, as was described earlier, about what agroforestry really is. But the one thing's for sure is agroforestry just has a whole slew of, of enhanced ecosystem service possibilities, everything from economics to climate solutions and water quality improvement, habitat and all that, that was so eloquently put earlier. Um, and so that's kind of exactly what we are focusing on. We're, we're, we're catalyzing a new way to farm, specifically focusing in the, in the Midwest. And also to acknowledge that we are not the only ones doing this. There, there are folks all over the world. There's so amazing folks and partners all over this country and all over the Midwest doing this. 
And, and we are really, we are a, a structural nonprofit organization doing this, but we, we really are work, focusing on working with our partners and enhancing partnerships and enhancing others to really do this good work um, and, and researching and, and taking the time to understand how to do this better. So, you know, we are working in a very large community of folks that are, are doing this work across the country. Um, now, like I said, I'm going to focus on a little bit about what my back, my work is here with Span Institute and what we're what we do as an organization. So, like I said, our mission is to catalyze the development and adoption of resilient agroforestry systems in the Midwest. Um, we do this with uh, focusing on tree crops themselves, um, actually looking at breeding and uh, restoring genetic repositories and looking for for a good quality enhanced genetics um, and figuring out how to actually um, grow those into it in a system that is economically and ecologically viable where it makes sense and how it makes sense. And then we, we look to find ways to kind of strengthen our stakeholders. Um, and that could be through education, uh, through direct influence and helping with consulting or whatever with farms. Um, engaging other landowners to think about different models of, of farming or agroforestry systems and that sort of thing. So it's kind of a, a threefold, uh, multi-pronged process that we go through. And I'll kind of describe a little bit more of these in detail. Um, the way we kind of go about doing this specifically is, is again, we're kind of moving into this, this kind of linear progression, um, moving forward from here where we are looking at breeding programs and genetic repositories and, and kind of rediscovering the good and best genetics doing R&D on how to produce them in ways that are more efficient or more ecologically uh, viable or ways that would just, in a sense, get people to actually plant them and care about them <laughs> in the world is, is probably the second hardest thing uh, next to finding these things. Obviously there's amazing people out there finding these things, <laughs> um, these species and, and remembering them and reminding us of them. Um, and then we're, we're actually piloting these systems. So we're, we're developing a number of go first farms where we actually implement the systems, um, demonstrate how they work across different contexts, different soil types, different climate zones, um, different communities, um, and then find resources to help folks scale it up. So it, it's an actual viable system in the Midwest. And I'm seeing a lot of this specifically because the Midwest, as we all know, is very large industrial ag. So we do tend to think Right now, a lot of our focus is on these broad scale agricultural acres. We are really out to supplant corn and bean farming. <laughs> um, not directly, we are kind of looking at a successional system, but that are, is lar a large focus of, of our, is looking at these large scale systems to have a large scale impact. And of course, along the way, working at all the other different scales from orcharding, small scale orcharding to urban forestry, urban food forests and these sorts of things. But a lot of our work really is kind of tailored on research on kind of larger scale systems. So we can really kind of work our way into more broader landscape dynamics um, for broader change. Um, some of our programs uh, uh, that we specifically do this with is through education and outreach, te technical support for adoption, uh, research, tree crop commercialization programs, uh, demonstration farm neck, uh, network in the Spring Green campus, and I'll go through each of these really quick. So our education um, and outreach program, uh, we have an apprenticeship program, which with an online course, and um, and we connect uh, apprentices with uh, various farms across the region, um, so they get on-farm experience and an online, full online course. Uh, we also have a ton of field days, webinars, an annual conference, the Perennial Farm Gathering, a, a pitch for that is coming up this February. Um, and then we have a ton of uh, media and resources that we put out on our website, social media and all that good stuff. Um, so our education outreach is a very strong focus of ours and has been the primary focus of the Savannah Institute. Um, and now we actually start moving into more kind of land-based uh, programs. Um, so technical support's one of them. This was recently la launched this past year in partnership with the, Natural Resource, the NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, and a few other programs where we can actually go out and do one-on-one -on -one, uh, farm consulting. We're specifically focusing on natural resource concerns and preservation, but also helping with kind of the economic and agronomic agroforestry systems as well, especially in large scale alley cropping and silvopasture. Um, but we are focusing a lot as well on these edge field practices like riparian buffers and 
windbreaks and alley cropping and, and contour buffer strips and these sorts of things that can help with water quality. Water quality is a big focus for us in the Midwest as it is everywhere, as it should be. Um, right now our focus areas is, is southern Wisconsin and northern and central Illinois, but we are expanding that into Iowa and, and Minnesota as well, and hopefully through the Great Lakes Basin pretty soon. Um, research is another big thing that's um, another big program that, that's launching um, really rapidly at this point. It's been a big part of our organization since the beginning, since a lot of this was, uh, Span and Sue was founded by uh, grad students at University of Illinois. Um, and University of Wisconsin at Madison while they're doing their PhD program. So uh, research is kind of baked into our program. Um, but we are now, we have now just hired a research director. So we're really launching a whole new realm of research that'll focus on a lot of kind of genomic uh, tool sampling for, for looking at different breeding programs that we're looking into. Um, we do work primarily in kind of zone six, zone three. Um, so a lot of this is we're really in more so in the zone five, four region. Um, so we are really looking at varietal trials specifically for, for the kind of cold hardiness climates um, of the Midwest where we're going to have our larger impacts. So we're working on a lot of different uh, varietal trials um, on a number of different species. That list is not conclusive. Um, we're expanding that pretty tremendously. Um, we have a number of field experiments we're getting started with that I'll talk about in a moment with uh, some of our home farms, um, looking at specifically uh, carbon sequestration and water quality dynamics. Um, and then we have a lot of other things like uh, ground cover, uh, prairie planting, uh, you know, savanna restoration, different tree tubes, mat efficiencies, different planting strategies, um, kind of getting the maxes uh, point on some of the wildlife considerations with some of these species, really looking into that since we do live in a, in a prairie landscape, prairie savanna landscape, um, where that restoration is priority. Um, and then we have a lot of uh, different technology developments with uh, hazelnut harvesters and, um, and different kind of automated uh, processing and aggregation systems. Um, and yes, robotic chestnut harvesters is a thing. <laughs> um, but also with GIS tools, where we're actually kind of building tools to help landowners and um, interested parties find, uh, find areas in their region that actually work best for certain crops. And this is just kind of a start. It's kind of a research program but also it's just a way to build tools for helping uh, farmers that are interested in agroforestry kind of see what's feasible on their landscape based on what we're learning and what all the experts in the, in the community are, are discovering and having a more networking and sharing platform available for folks to kind of hit the ground running without kind of reinventing the wheel over and over again. Um, similarly with tree crop commercialization, this is a really important thing for agroforestry. A lot of the crops we're working on do not have established markets at this time. Um, are really challenged by that market end of things. Um, our, you know, American culture doesn't like new things. <laughs> um, and we are working with things that are not new, but people seem to have forgotten them, um, which is pretty sad, but it's kind of true. Um, and so we are actually actively working with a, a whole slew of different stakeholders and partners on different market and supply chain uh, pathways for making sure that these these species and these production systems actually have kind of a long, long range successful story. Um, so we're working on aggregation systems, like I said, kind of uh, facilities for aggregation and processing and co-op development um, and, um, you know, harvesters and, and hubs, regional hubs to kind of help with, with accessing harvesting and processing equipment and all those sorts of uh, different bottlenecks that we were kind of discovering as we, we deep dive research into a number of these different species. And we're putting out that literature on our website and making it public, publicly available so other communities can kind of understand, get a, get a jump start on understanding what are some bottlenecks even you know, nationally about what, what, uh, what some of these cropping systems are facing and, and how they might strategize in their own community and make sure that works for them. Particularly right now, we have the hazelnut and the chestnut um, impact investment plan out. Um, and I think that elderberry one and the current one is coming soon. Um, but there'll be many more to follow with that, hopefully. Um, we also have a whole network of demonstration farms across the region. Um, some of these demonstration farms are ones that we actively manage um, and we design, planted, and actively manage. Um, and then there's others, of course, with partnership farms that we work a lot, we work very closely with. Um, we have great relationships and partners with, we use for education and the apprenticeship programs, that sort of thing. 
Um, and these demonstration farm programs are really important for getting the word out. And I think the NAFEX uh, conference a few years back visited a few of these, and particularly in, in Illinois. Um, this one actually, Allerton is new. Um, this is an 80 acre cornfield um, that was uh, where they integrated uh, different, an experiment of different ground covers. So some have prairie strips, some have just Dutch white clover, um, different prairie strips in, in the tree crops. You can see the, the tree tubes um, in the picture on the right. Um, and then primarily the, the tree species in there are hedgerows of timber species. Um, so all native species, uh, there are persimmon and pawpaw and, and hickories and oaks and um, a whole slew of, of timber species. And, you know, the idea is to maintain this corn corn system because this is an alley cropping demonstration, a long-term alley cropping demonstration, but to demonstrate how you can work at commodity scale systems. Um, one of the farms that the NAFEX community visited um, a number of years back was Saturn and Vulcan Farm. And Saturn Farm is the farm with the, the black currant plantation. Um, uh, plantation, but black currant <laughs> orchard, um, but also a polyculture of uh, black locusts and pawpaws and chestnuts and heart nuts and all the different things. And with alley cropping of rhubarb and asparagus, and that's going really, really well. Um, these pictures are not as recent as I hope, um, as I should have. Um, but this year was the, I think the third mechanical harvest. You see the Joanna in the upper left corner, um, the Joanna harvester, uh, mechanical harvester for black currants. Um, and the harvests are, are increasing every year and there's great data coming out by, with the different cultivars that are plant, uh, planted out there. And it's just a fantastic resource of information um, as we kind of get started on these kind of commodity, almost commodity scale orchards. This is a 20 acre uh, black currant planting here. Um, Silverwood is a demonstration farm in Wisconsin, uh, not too far from me. Um, this is uh, currently right now, we have an organic uh, farmer uh, cropping in the alleyways. This is a 30 acre site. Uh, we have a chestnut varietal trial, uh, looking at cold hardiness um, varieties. Um, a lot of these are coming from Tom Wall and in Iowa and Badger Set and Paul from um, Bill Rudder in Minnesota and uh, all over the place. A lot of Chinese American hybrids, um, but a whole seven of different, all planted out and replicated um, a varietal trial. So we can really see what, what species are doing really well. We're planting some hazelnuts out here. This is on a county, county park uh, with a lot of public access and visibility. Um, and, and as this system progress, hopefully even next year, we're working with an, another partner that is um, from the Oneida Nation that's good looking at using this as a as a seed corn um, preservation site, as well as integrating livestock in that. So this is a really awesome. All of these demonstration farms work are working in partnerships with other community, community members to kind of support the important work that a lot of other partners are working on throughout the region. Like I said, it's not just us doing this. Um, this, is, this takes a whole, whole community to make all of this work. Uh, this is just another, Picture of this site right now, we have it set at 80 foot wide alleys with a very large scale organic cropper. Um, and then this will slowly get trees planted down the middle of these 80 foot alleys and slowly succeed into a more integrated uh, system over time. Uh, last year was uh, sunflowers for uh, sunflower oil. This year was dry beans. It was a pretty cool site to see. Lastly, and part of uh, my work, which I'm specifically focusing on with the Span Institute is the Spring Green Campus. Um, I feel like I'm missing a slide. Yeah. Um, so the, the Savannah Institute has been challenged with a lot of these demonstration farms and, uh, on a number of different fronts, primarily around the research and the, the genetic repository components and the, and the ability to advance genetics through breeding. Um, it's very difficult to do that on uh, sites that we don't actually own or have long-term stewardship for. The, part of the Wisconsin uh, state constitution does not allow for anything longer than a 15 year lease, uh, which doesn't work with <laughs> tree crop breeding and tree crop genetic repository. So we've actually moved into a situation where we are purchasing uh, a number of properties um, in the Spring Green, Wisconsin, Southwestern Wisconsin, um, right along the Wisconsin River, uh, which is an incredibly culturally and ecologically important site, which I can go on about forever, 15, 20 minutes is, I'm whizzing through this stuff, but I'm getting very impassioned about this, this community and this, this space. Um, but so we, we have three sites, a total of 700 acres, uh, about 400 of which is cropland. The remaining is in kind of prairie and savanna and woodlot. 
um, where these sites are specifically for germplasm repositories and tree crop breeding programs. We're developing a tree crop nursery to support some of our uh, work with implementing agroforestry systems throughout the Midwest. Um, we are also piloting a lot of these tree crop species in these um, larger scale systems. So the hybrid hazel, um, we are planting next year, we're, and I'll talk about that in a minute, we're planting the first um, clonally uh, propagated hybrid hazel um, plantation in the Midwest. So that's a really exciting project. Um, and uh, these sites are, are really geared towards research, research and R&D. We're, we're not doing this for production for, for our own agronomic purposes. But like I said earlier, these kind of go first. How do, we, how do you do silvopasture? How do you do silvopasture in a savanna? How do you do, uh, you know, chestnut alley cropping in, a, in the cold <laughs> zone four region? Um, you know, what species actually work in this region? And, and really trying to get a lot of this data before we put a lot of this information out and really encourage farmers to adopt this. We're, we're trying to go for a very low risk approach to getting farmers to adopt these systems. Um, so we really want to try to understand the best methods possible for doing that. Um, you got, you got two more minutes. Great, thanks. Um, a lot of uh, uh, prairie and savanna restoration that we're going to be doing on this site, um, which is really these sites, which is really exciting and, and a lot to learn from there. Uh, working with the Aldo Leopold Foundation and other key partners on, on prairie restoration and burning systems and how that works in agroforestry. Um, and we're also going to host a number of educational opportunities and uh, long-term apprenticeship programs, multi-year apprenticeship programs on this on these sites as well. Um, like I said, Spring Green Campus, Spring Green, Wisconsin. Um, they kind of surround a very small community about an hour outside of Madison. Um, landscape is pretty typical of the driftless, the unglaciated region of the Midwest, which is very, very unique, uh, both geologically and ecologically and culturally. Um, again, I can wax on that in a lot more than five minutes I have left. Um, and like I said, we, we are in a prairie savanna based ecosystem. So it's kind of a homage to our name, um, but we are really trying to understand what, what does this look like going forward? How do we do this going forward? Um, and this is what really excites me about my work is how do we look at these, as Zach said, these kind of cultural landscapes, which is what a lot of my background is. Um, in other parts of the, of the United States, but not here in the Midwest. So really trying to understand who's here and what's, in, and what's going on and why, and, and what that can translate to what kind of system we're looking at developing. So, I, so stay tuned for a lot of our design work because we're really kind of behind on that <laughs> and, and getting into gear on doing that this winter. Um, like I said, we're doing the, the first colonially propagated hazelnut plantation uh, orchard. Um, as well as uh, chestnuts on this site, first thing, 2022. Uh, we have a lot of other plans for the other spaces out here, namely uh, restoring or converting cropland to silvopasture. So that's another big challenge we actually have not owning property is you know, on these kind of demonstration farms is how do you do silvopasture with livestock um, with good rotational grazing practices. So a lot of these farms are actually going to be converted out of cropland um, on this very hilly sandy soil and into grazing systems. Um, and we'll be working a ton with <clears throat> enhancing uh, mechanical harvesters. We're actually designing, working with a whole team of awesome folks, designing our own pool behind the uh, hazelnut harvester. Like I said, cold hardiness program with um, chestnuts starting this year. And yeah, there's tons of ways to get involved. Um, reach out to spaninstitute.org. We have, like I said, uh, annual conference. We also work a lot with the AFTA, the uh, um, Association of Tempered Agroforestry. Um, we've got host conferences all over the country every other year. So there's tons of ways to get involved and learn more. Um, so don't hesitate to reach out. Sorry, that was so fast. That's all right. Thank, sorry for <laughs> rushing you. Thank you so much, Eric. So we got, we got a ton of questions in here. Uh, Chris, I know we only have like 11 minutes left. So Chris is going to read them out and uh, we'll try and try and do these, do these yeah, let's, quick. Let's, cr let's crush it. I can't turn my video on, but whatever. Um, so uh, like he said, a ton of great questions, a uh, lot of pro thought provoking things. There is a question from uh, Shona Ort and it was uh, seconded by Brett Anderson. And uh, I'm gonna kind of cobble these together, but this was about uh, basically assisted migration 
And uh, are there agroforestry crops in the south that aren't in the Hershey collection that uh, we could bring north to the mid-Atlantic and northeast, and frankly, to the Pacific Northwest? And, uh, and then the follow-up would be also that uh, what are some southern sources of genetic material that are available for us to use in assisted migration? Is there a TBA collection, et cetera? So Taylor, go ahead. Yeah, I think, I think, uh, sorry, I zoned out there. Uh, Max, you want, you want to go for that one? Sure. Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. Um, there's a lot of answers to it. So in terms of, um, source, yeah, in terms of other Southern crops or Southeastern crops that aren't in the Hershey collection, uh, there are a number, a lot of them he had, but they died out, um, just over the years when it was neglected for 60 years. So all the wild plums, especially Chickasaw plum, actually, this is a question that, that I think Zach uh, knows quite a bit about um, because he's, he's been working directly with this type of thing for, for much longer than I have. So I'll let him speak to that. Um, but the, in terms of sourcing material, um, I know there's a number of, of nurseries and, um, you know, large, small, everything in between. Some of them are actually NAFIX members in, in the Southeast who have really excellent excellent material. Um, I know there's, you know, certain like Southern apples that you can get um, for, for things like Yopan, which, you know, people say is only hardy to zone eight. There's, you know, Hoskin shadow uh, cultivar, which is hardy to zone six. So a lot of this stuff is about uh, experimenting and pushing the boundaries of what's hardy. And uh, one person who's been doing really excellent work with that is um, Kenny Asmus up at Oikos Tree Crops. He's been growing Southern genetic cr like crops of everything and anything you haven't, haven't, haven't heard of for the past, I don't know, like 20, 30 years. And he's had like some amazing discoveries up there. And so I think, uh, I think he just closed down his nursery, but he just opened up an Instagram page, which is in inspires me every day. So I think you should follow that. Um, right. But uh, I'll, uh, Zach, I'll, I'll let you talk more about like some some more southern uh, some southern crops that can be brought up north. Sure. Uh, well, Max, you did a really good job of covering it. I'm not really sure what to say. Uh, I, I second your your notion that a lot of the NAFEX members are a really good resource for acquiring germplasm. There, supposedly, there's still remnants of the TBA plantings. Taylor would know more about that. Um, but again, you know, a lot of this stuff, even, even if the germplasm exists in a planting, a lot of these plantings have been neglected. And so in a lot of ways, the work of the fruit explorers is to go in and understand what we're looking at again, trying to put the pieces back together, identifying cultivars. I mean, look at what Eliza Greenman is doing, for example, she's really gone through the the J. Russell Smith plantings down in Virginia, and there's a ton of trees, and they're all grafted. You know, they're all cultivars of some sort, but we don't really know what they are. There's no tags left. You know, there's no labels. So, um, yeah, I I think there's there's for the for at least the rest of our generation, there's going to be some serious work to do just in the exploring side of things, and that goes for old farms as well as wild plantings, um, wild wild trees that exist there. Um, don't neglect our wild resources. There's a gold mine of germplasm out there just waiting to be discovered. Um, let's let's uh, yeah. let's ask another uh, question. This, this actually comes from uh, two different people and uh, Taylor, you'll know who this goes to. Um, but uh, one is uh, books that have recorded indigenous wisdom uh, when it comes to agriculture and agroforestry. And another is actually resources on uh, potentially uh, tree species and what, um, what species they support. Um, and, uh, and then also I'll just weave in general resources too. So for folks. Um, so at the end of Zach's presentation, there was a uh, recommended books, um, thing. So we'll, ha we'll have that on the website. The, the, this video will be up, um, tomorrow. 
but uh, maybe we could do like a quick draw if y'all each wanted to say like a book that just comes to mind that you would share or if you if you have one that you would would like to share um, starting with Zach. And then maybe Max. Uh, well, the, the question was specifically asking for like spiritual ecological um, wisdom. It sounded like uh, that could be I, part of it. Yeah, you can answer that. I think uh, braiding sweetgrass would be a really good place to start from uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, as far as like the nuts and bolts of uh, like all the pieces go, there's uh, a lot of really good books out there. And there's also a surprising lack of books out there. there uh, so there's, yeah, <laughs> I, I referred back to the book list I, I shared. Yeah, I um, for me, yeah, Zach, Zach's list uh, kind of said it all for me. I think the only ones, and you might have had these on your list, uh, I, I don't remember, but uh, it's not for the East Coast, but I remember reading um, Keeping It Living, which is uh, like a, a book about like Pacific Northwest um, indigenous life ways and, and ways of, of um, methods of, of landscape stewardship that that was the first book I ever read that opened my eyes to like what was actually possible with, for, I mean, even like human relationships with the planet and to like, to that depth. And it has, you know, it, it's, it's a really special book and there's, there's a couple others like that, but unfortunately we don't have anything like that for the East coast yet. Um, but that would be, that's the only other thing I can think of that Zach hasn't mentioned. I was going to say the same book, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think on the, the native stuff, the, the indigenous community work, you know, a lot of these are written by anthropologists. They're written by, by um, the non-native community. And there's a lot of things lost in the translation. Now, Nancy Turner did with Keeping a Living did an amazing job um, working with the, with those tribal community members. She's a true ethnobotanist, um, but there's, you know, just, there's a lot of caution out there, out there. And I think the really the best way if you really want to get good information is get engaged with the indigenous community, meet people. Uh, it's, it's an oral tradition. Um, and, and a lot of this work is, you know, continuing with this work does require the permission of that community by to carry on the torch and to carry on the language that they use. Um, so you know, a book is good. It's a good, it's a good start. Um, and there's a ton of them. Gary Nabham is another one that is a great one to get any, any of his writing. Enduring Seeds is probably one of my favorite of his, but, um, but really it is about engaging the community if you really want to get to know indigenous um, practices and actually be able to be a supporter of that because it is really them that should be carrying that torch. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, unfortunately we are out of time. Uh, but thank you, Eric, Max, and Zach so much. I really enjoyed that. Um, folks, I know we didn't get to most of your questions. I don't know if you panelists can answer any of those questions by typing it real quick while we're still here. If you want, I was trying to do that a little bit here. Um, also, folks could ask it in the NAFEX Facebook group if you want. Um, but I'm gonna close us out here on behalf of NAFEX. I would like to thank our panel for making this uh, such a great session for sure. Once again, the recording of this session will be made available on the NAFEX.org webpage in 24 hours and will be posted in about a year on our NAFEX TV YouTube channel. Um, there may also be some other downloadable content on our webpage for the conference attendees. And please don't miss our other sessions in our 2021 virtual conference. And please stay connected on social media uh, you'll find all of those links on our nafex.org homepage. So thank you all again. And I wish we had more time. So maybe next year. Yes.